About, what would it be, 500 years ago, there was a Jew in Europe, Spinoza was his name, Baruch Spinoza, a philosopher, and he wrote a great deal. And he made the same point that people were making 500 years before him. He was frustrated when the Christians would come to him and say, God became man. He would say, what do you mean? God became man. See, I know what is God and I know what is man. And I can imagine that what was God turned into a man. It's not God anymore. He used to be God. Now he's a man. I can understand that. That at least makes some sense. But that's not what the church teaches. They say, God became man, but he was still God. And that causes a problem. You see, if I have a ball of clay and I squeeze it and I put corners on it and I make it into a cube, I can tell you, you see, the ball became a cube, but I can't tell you, don't be fooled, it's still round. See, if it was one thing, it became another thing, it's not that thing anymore. They solve that by putting a label on it, they call it diophysitism. Doesn't prove anything, it means two natures, diophysitism. That's an old trick, when you don't know the answer, put a label on it. In ancient Greece, the Greeks, 25 centuries ago, came to their scientists with a question. They'd observed that you eat food, it goes through the system, and some of it comes out. They wanted to know which part of what I take in is the part that feeds me, because evidently I don't need all of it, you see. Well, now, which is the nutritive faculty of the food? And the scientists didn't know, so they said, the part that feeds you is the nutritive faculty of the food. It's like saying the part that feeds you is the part that feeds you. It's all. It's a label. Doesn't answer anything. I say I could talk to you for hours about experiences. About 1977, I decided to have a look at the Quran. I never met a Muslim. I lived 100 kilometers from the nearest Muslim. See, what interested me was what non-Muslims said about Muhammad. There are books and books written about Muhammad that tell you one thing we know for sure about this man: he had an outside source of information. One book I've got says the Quran was written by a committee because they've established so well that there's information in there that an Arabian shouldn't have known. He must have had someone from the outside bringing him this information. So they say, one thing we know for sure, he had an outside source of information. Now he said this book was a revelation. So they say, you see, he was a liar. He got it from somewhere, he put it in a book, and he gave it to someone telling him it was from God. He was a liar. Other people write books and books on the subject of Muhammad, and they say, one thing we know for sure, he thought he was a prophet. He was crazy. Because they look at his life very carefully, and they see episodes like, for example, when he hid in the cave with Abu Bakr. He was running from the whole city who wanted to kill him, and he hid in the cave. And when the Meccans came running up to the cave to kill them, what did he say to his friend? Did he tell him, see if you can find a back way out of the cave? What he told his friend was, relax. He was telling him, you know, I see what you see. But he said, God is with us. God will save us. So people on that basis, they say, you see, he thought he was a prophet. He thought God was with him because he said things like that. He wasn't a liar. They never seem to realize that one man can't be both. So you can't be a liar and a crazy man at the same time. If you think that an angel gives the words of God in your ear and somebody says, I have a question for you, what does God tell you about this thing? I will want to hear an answer tomorrow. If you are a crazy man, if you think an angel whispers in your ear, then you don't sit up that night thinking, what will I tell him tomorrow? What can I find? Who knows the answer? You're crazy. You think the angel will tell you the answer. You don't go and look it up somewhere. You so see, you can't be a liar and a crazy man at the same time. You can be one or the other, or neither, but you can't be both. You see, I read two non-Muslim biographies of Muhammad. One was by Rodinson, who was an atheist, who hated the man. But many interesting things come up about his life that I had to wonder about. One story that's told is that when he was an older man, he had a son named Ibrahim, Abraham. The son died when the child was two years old. The same day the boy died, there was an eclipse of the sun. 
sky went dark. And the Muslims came running to their prophet and said, look, it's a miracle. Your child died and the sky went dark in sadness. It occurred to me, see, if he was a crazy man, he'd probably believe what they said. He'd probably think, yes, it's a miracle. My child died, the sky is dark. Yes, it's a miracle. If he was a crazy man, if he was a liar, he would have taken advantage of it. He would have said, yes, right, my child died, the sky is dark, you tell everyone, it proves I'm a prophet. It's a miracle. But what did he do? He became angry with the Muslims. He told them that was nonsense. He was angry with them. How dare you say that? He said, the sun and the moon are signs of God, and they don't worry themselves about the birth of a man or the death of a son of Muhammad. Doesn't look very crazy, he doesn't look much like a liar. Now you have a third alternative, of course, which people tell you all the time. You say, no, he was not a liar. He was not a crazy man. He was deceived by the devil. Deceived by the devil. It's an interesting idea, but whatever you say, you better be ready to back it up. There's a lot of difficulties with that idea. For example, there is a verse in the Quran which tells the reader about a good habit to develop. It tells him, before you read this book, always say, A'udhu billahi mina shaitani rajim, which means, I take refuge in God from Satan, the rejected. Is this Satan who wrote this? Who said, before you read my book, ask God to save you from me? Is that Satan who wrote that? As Jesus said, if Satan is divided against himself, then his kingdom will fall. He's fighting against his own interests. So let me finish with a point that, a story that illustrates a point. As I said, there's many theories and many explanations around, many explanations. But an explanation, something somebody tells you, is just so much air coming out of his mouth unless he has proof and unless he offers you something that you can use to falsify it. You see, there's many theories of how do the planets go around the sun and how do the stars burn and all the rest of it. Many theories. Most of them are just so much wind. Scientists pay no attention to them because they don't contain something that could be checked to prove it false. You see, Einstein was considered an intelligent man because when he offered his theory in 1905 and again in 1915, he didn't just offer a theory, he said, here's three ways to prove I'm wrong. Now it's worth listening to. He's told me, here's three different things you can do. If you can do this, I'm wrong. Here you are. Is there anything like that in Christianity? Has the Christian ever said, you want to prove I'm wrong? All you have to do is this. Has he ever done that? The Quran is filled with that kind of thing, filled with it. Saying, you want to prove this book is wrong? Do this. Prove it. Go ahead. Do it. Filled with that kind of thing. There's an example of it that made a big impression in its day, during the lifetime, 14 centuries ago, of the Prophet of Islam. You see, he had an uncle named Abu Lahab. That was his nickname, Abu Lahab. This man hated Muhammad. He hated anything the man said. He used to watch him going through the city, and if he saw him talking to someone, he waited till they split up. He'd go after the man he spoke to and take him and say, what did Muhammad tell you? Whatever it is, it's a lie. Did he tell you day? It's night. Did he say black? It's white. Exact opposite. Whatever he heard the Muslims say, he said the opposite. That was the way his mind worked. There's a little chapter of the Quran called Lahab, and it says about this man that he'll never change. It condemns him to hell, Jahannam. You see, if the man had ever become a Muslim, the Muslims would believe, well, now he's not condemned anymore. You see, for 10 years before Abu Lahab died, that was a part of the Quran. And the Muslims could come to Abu Lahab and say, do you know, it's been revealed to us in our book that you will never be a Muslim. God says you will never be a Muslim. For 10 years they told him that. All he had to do was say, well, your book is wrong. I want to be a Muslim. What do you think of your book now? That's all he had to do. He had 10 years to think about it. And that's the way he was. See, if somebody is your enemy, you don't come to him and say, you want to prove I'm wrong? Here, say this. Come on, say it. If all you have to do is say the words and I'm wrong, you finish me. 
He never did it. See, this is one of many cases of something that was offered that could have been falsifiable. So it was. As I say, in 1978, after, how long would that be, 15 years of arguing with the church authorities one place or another, I got the idea, I'm going to argue with some other people. I'm going to read the Koran, see how much of it is any good, pick out the true, pick out the false. I thought it'll take a few years, it'll take some serious study and so on. I read through it, about three days later I finished it. I said, this is what I've been saying for 15 years. So I went to find some Muslims. I don't want somebody to feel you've been tricked into something. I haven't said anything about Christianity that isn't true. I haven't said anything about Islam that isn't true unless it was a slip of the tongue or something. I'm simply trying to remind an individual, don't close your mind before it's too late. Don't make up your mind before you have all the facts. Most people who used to be Christians and become Muslims will tell you, I am a better Christian than I used to be. Now I follow Christ. I didn't before. That's what I would tell you. The Bible says Jesus told his disciples, when you greet one another, let your greeting be, peace be with you. He set the example, peace be with you. Who says that today? Christians? Once in a great while, maybe. Muslims, whether they speak Arabic or not, they say, Salaam Alaikum. Peace be with you. Jesus, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, put his forehead on the ground. Who prays like that, Christians or Muslims? Jesus used to fast for more than a month at a time. Who fasts today, Christians or Muslims? Who really is trying to imitate Jesus? Somebody said to me uh, uh, before coming in here, they said, uh, the Muslims make Jesus out, uh, they insult him and so on and so on. How possibly do they insult him? They lift him up up. They can't tolerate anything bad said about him. They would just as quickly tell you that, you know, the, the, they say Muhammad Rasulullah means Muhammad is the messenger of God. They will just as quickly say, Isa, Jesus, Isa, Rasulullah, no problem. Just as quickly tell you that because it's true. They occupy the same place. If God himself wants to make distinctions among his prophets, that's his business, not our. Treat them all with the same amount of respect. May God guide us always closer to the truth. Mr. Gary Raymond Miller, thank you, sir.